you, Lord. I want to thank you, Lord. Lord, I want to thank you. to thank you, Lord, because you've been, you've been, you've been good, you know, you've been, been so, been so good. be reading Psalms 100 verses 1 through 5. And those that are able would like you to stand please and repeat after me. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. And that he that has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter, his, enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into, into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endures to all generations. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endures to all generations. Let us pray now. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for blessing us with another beautiful day that we may enjoy that you've given us. We thank you for coming into your house so we can hear the word that you're about to bestow on us. We all will be your sponge. We will take that word, soak it in through our hearts, our minds, and our souls. And then we will take that word and take that sponge and just squeeze it all over our community. In your name we pray, amen. Good morning, church. Let's turn our handbooks to 666. Trouble sometimes are here. Feeling is hard with fear. Freedom we all hold dear. Now is at stake. Christians away. Christians away. My Jesus is coming. Morning, night, or noon. Many will meet their doom. Oh Lord, trumpet will sound. Hey, and all of the days shall rise. Let's go. 
very fast. Trumpets will sound. Hey, my Jesus is coming. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, this part of the worship service is the communion, and it is the time when we reflect on back on what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ did for us on the cross, where he sat, where he became the sin offering. He did the things that... Um, in the Old Testament, the animal sacrifices couldn't do. 
back then, the, on, the animal sacrifices only covered the sins, and those people who followed God, they had to come and have those things, those sins covered, but it didn't completely take it away. So it went with them with their went with them to the graves. But him becoming a more perfect sacrifice, we have the right to stand before the throne because this the blood not only that it covered but it washed away the sin so when we stand before God we stand justified and as some would say just as if we never sinned in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 Verse 23, it reads, For I receive of the Lord, the which I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he had given thanks. He broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner also, he took the cup and said, after supping, he said, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whosoever shall eat this bread or drink this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of the cup. For he who eateth and drinketh in an unworthy manner, eateth and drinketh judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for the bread and we thanks, give thanks for the cup. We ask you to transfer this from a carnal nature to a spiritual nature. And let those who take it, take it in remembering, remembering of you and according to the scriptures. In Jesus' name, let us all say amen. everybody been served the next part of the worship service is where we are able to we're happy about giving back to God as he has blessed it as he has blessed us as being his dear children we are his property from the air we breathe the to the walks, the steps we make, the actions we take, the time that we give, anything that we produce that comes out of us belongs to him. Some areas in the world, they have a barter system. Some areas in the world have a financial system. But regardless of what it is, we give back to, we give back to God, not to man, but to God. We find in the book of... 1 Corinthians chapter 16, now concerning the collections of the saints, as I have given orders to the church of Galatia, even so do ye, that upon the first day of the week, let every one of you 
lay something aside, storing up that he may, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I go, when I come. We will have two collections: one for the general lay by, what is God has purposed in purposed in your heart, what you have purposed in your heart to give, and then the second collection will be for. Okay, it's a retirement fund for Jerry Stevenson, who is retiring for this weekend. So we have two collections. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for another day of life, health, and strength. We thank you for uh, for the things that we have been able to do and to, uh, to produce out of our abundance, out of your abundance. Lord, we give these things, we give this offering cheerfully not grudgingly nor out of necessity we thank you for all the bountiful blessings that you have for us laid up in store for us because of the thing because of our obedience and our sacrifice thank you for all of the things that we do that you do for us and we pray that the collections that we could that is picked up will be used for the benefit and for the uplifting of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm just a hard fighting soldier and I'm on the battlefield. Lord, I'm a hard fighting soldier and I'm on the battle. Oh, I'm just a hard Fighting so, Lord, and I'm on the battlefield, and I'm bringing souls to Jesus, Lord, by the service that I give. Well, I'm just a hard fighting soul, Lord, and I'm on.
this that I give. Well, you know, Satan, he will try, he'll try to lead you astray. You got to fight, keep on fighting for my Jesus, keep fighting every day. Cause when you see me, ah, they'll try. You know, sometimes I shed a tear And I'm bringing souls to Jesus Lord, by the service that Hey, I'm just a hard-fighting soul Lord, and I'm on the Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm just a This that I give Well, you got to walk and talk Sing and pray I'm on the battle Lord, I've got to walk right Talk right, sing right and pray right I'm on the battle Oh, I've got to walk right Talk right, sing right, pray right. I'm on the battlefield, and I'm bringing souls to Jesus, Lord, by the service that I give. Don't you want to go to that land? Don't you want to go to that land? Don't you want to go to that land where I'm bound, where I'm bound? Don't you want to go to that land? Don't you want to go to that land? Don't you want to go to that land where I'm bound, where I'm bound? There's nothing but peace in that land, nothing but peace in that land. Nothing but peace in that land where I'm bound, where I'm bound. Nothing but peace in that land. Nothing but peace in that land. Nothing but peace in that land where I'm bound, where I'm bound. There's nothing but joy in that land. Nothing but joy. In that land, nothing but joy. In that land, where I'm bound, where I'm bound, There's nothing but joy. In that land, nothing but joy. In that land, nothing but joy. In that land, where I'm bound, where I'm bound, I've got a savior in that land. I've got a savior in that land. I've got a savior in that land where I'm bound, where I'm bound. I've got a savior in that land. I've got a savior in that land. I've got a savior in that land where I'm bound. Yes, where I'm bound. Don't don't you want to go to that land? Don't you want to go to that land? Don't you want to go to that land? Where I'm bound, where I'm bound. Don't you want to go to that land? Don't you want to go to that land? Don't you want to go to that land? Where I'm bound, yes, where I'm bound. Uh, before scripture reading and prayer, let us notice page number 38 in our green and white folders. 
before scripture reading and prayer, page number 38. If you haven't, let's get a sing. I keep falling in love with him over and over and <laughs> over and over again. And I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. And it gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. And no other love between my Savior and I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. And I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. And I keep falling in love with him over and Sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. And no other love between my Savior and I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. Good morning, saints. Our scripture lesson will be taken from 1 Corinthians. 13th chapter, verses 4 through 7. It read, charity, let us stand. Charity suffers alone, and it is kind. Charity envies not. Charity wants not itself. It is not puffed up. Does not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoice in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. I read 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Through seven, may God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word, and especially those who are in obedience to the word of God. Let us bow. Our Father God, we are come before your throne of grace, your throne of mercy, where all of our blessings flow, because every good and every perfect gift come from you above. Without you, Lord, we are nothing, we can do nothing. We are thankful that you are our God, our Father in heaven. And besides you, there is none other. Thanking you, Lord, for a good night's sleep, watching over us during the night, no hurt, harm, danger, no sickness, and you kept the deaf angel away another day, whereby we can see this day, Father where we can come together to worship you both in spirit and in truth. Bless each and every one of us that are here, Father, that we all may receive a blessing as we worship and give you the praise and glory that you so deserve, Father. Father, we are thankful for all our many blessings, our daily blessing, our food on our tables, clothes on our back, roof of our heads, Father, our health, and our strength. And, Father, most of all, for your beloved son, Jesus, who freely gave his life, died on that old rugged cross that we, through obeying his will, might have a right to that tree of life. Father, we ask forgiveness of our repentant sins. Blot it out of your book of remembrance, Father. Then give us strength, Father, that we may be strong and be, give us the strength that we need to overcome and withstand the devil. Just increase our faith, Father, that we might be steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in your work, because your work is not in vain. Praying, Father, for those who are shut in and not able to be with us, Father, 
Those who are sick, Father, and not able to be with us, just touch their bodies, ease their pain, Father, that they will have a speedy recovery, that they may be able to be back with us once again. And, Father, we continue to give you glory and praise over our beloved sister, Carol, Father. Thanking you, Father, for bringing her through her ordeal and that she's on the road to a speedy and complete recovery. And we just give you the glory, give you the praise, Father. Just bless us as a congregation that we may continue to love one another and do those things that are pleasing in your sight. Be with us as we go further through the service. Everything we do, everything we say, we want you to get the glory. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, no, no kids church today. There will be no kids church today. So just want to let y'all know that. Without you, Lord. Without you, Lord. Oh, hey, I can't make. I just can't make it without you, Lord.
Trials dark on every hand, and we cannot understand hey, all the ways that God will lead us to, to that blessed promised land. But He'll guide us with His eye, and we will follow till we die. We will understand it better by and by. church say amen this morning. Amen. amen. It's so good to be here today to look out into this audience and see so many faces who look like and act like you're glad to be here. Yeah. And that's, all, that's, that's a good thing. I want to go on record as, uh, for saying uh, happy Father's Day to all of you uh, brothers in the house. Can I get a whoop whoop for the brothers in the house? <laughs> amen. Amen. I went out and saw my chief deacon today. When I walked in here, I saw Brother, Brother Cooper. Uh, I haven't seen him in about 40 years. And it's good to walk in and see his smile. Yeah, I'm putting you on blast today. Amen. I want to say also that uh, for all of you who are visiting with us, we just, from the very depths of our heart, we say uh, welcome to the Lion Street Church of Christ. We hope and pray that you're edified and, and built up in the most holy faith uh, on uh, today. And those who may be viewing virtually, we want to say to you, welcome, and we consider you as well our honored guest. And we want to afford you with every courtesy we can. Uh, but the main thing we want to do is break unto you the bread of life today. We're going to go into the word of God that the word of God may encourage us, uh, may uh, challenge us and even restore us to where God wants us to be. Is that all right? So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to uh, 1 uh, Corinthians, the 13th chapter. And today we're going to be looking at the character and characteristics of fatherhood. The character, that's, that's something about you that... Uh, regardless of circumstance, that who you are when no one's looking, that integrity, that what measures who you are and what you are about is a constant. Yeah. But you see that character manifests itself through various characteristics. Certain things about you that allow you to respond to different circumstances based on your character. 
And so today we're going to be looking at the character and the characteristics of fatherhood. But when I say that, let's keep it on the 100. We're really talking about uh, the character and characteristics of God. Yes, our, every father in the house today, we want you to understand this is your day. But guess what? I speak and represent all of you by saying I am flawed. I am not perfect. Uh, so don't judge fatherhood based on me. Judge fatherhood based on our heavenly father, who is the one who is unimpeachable. He is the one who is impeccable. He is the one who is able to uh, grant us everything that we need according to his riches and glory. And so therefore, as we begin to venture into this, this is a Father's Day special today. Father's Day special today. I want to make sure that we understand that we're really talking about the character and the characteristics of love. Amen. Yeah, because God is love. That's right. And so we're going to, that's why we're going to be looking in this particular book. Uh, this book, uh, 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter. Because it gives us an expose. It gives us a critique of love. Now, let me just say that uh, this passage, it sheds light on the heart and soul of a loving father. As we observe uh, the character traits uh, that define the depth of uh, the breadth and height and length of a father's love, it will help us. Uh, to understand and to model the magnitude of God's love for his children. Amen. And when you understand how God loves his children, it gives us, it leaves us some breadcrumbs. It leaves us a trail to follow. It leaves us a model, an example as to how we can be the father that God wants us to be. Amen. That we can be the community leaders uh, and church leaders, uh, home pace setters that God wants us to be. And we will follow the breadcrumbs. God gives us the grace to do that. And so today I want to give a salute. Now I want to give a, a bold face shout out to all men and to encourage all men who accept the challenge. For it is a challenge. Let's not uh, uh, kind of gloss over that. Fatherhood, uh, being a Christian, who displays love, that is a challenge. It's not easy Amen. to do what God wants you to do when your flesh is screaming for you to do what you want to do. And so today, I think we're blessed today because God has given us this passage that will help us uh, to understand and accept the challenge of being the pace setter in our families. Being the pace setter in our community, being the very pace setter in the church, uh, the person that God needs us to be as a city on the hill that gives guidance, encouragement, and direction from all, for all those who would dare to follow Jesus. Right. Amen. I want to remind us that the men of God must recognize these expectations and allow God, in as much as we are inadequate, that we are not worthy, we don't measure up. So therefore, we must humble ourselves in order to allow God uh, to shape us, to contour us, and to fashion us uh, into the image of fatherhood. Are y'all ready for this? Yes. Brother Meriwether, why are you using this passage and why are you talking about this today? It's more than just a date on the calendar that dictates, uh, that we discuss uh, from a very, very pure perspective on what fatherhood or what Christian love is all about. Uh, I, I think um, it helps us to step up to the plate. Now, all the women, I want you to say, step up, step up. to the plate. <laughs> now, all the men, now, no, ladies, this is your time now. You've been wanting to say this a long time, didn't have a platform to say it. <laughs> Repeat as we step up, step up. To, the to the plate. And all the men answer and say, I got this. <laughs> oh, yeah, we got this. <laughs> By the grace of God, we got this. 
And, and so we must fulfill our promise. Not only our promise to our children, uh, but our promise to God. Hello. We must fulfill our promise to God. And as you strive to fulfill your promise to God, that's going to make you a better husband, a better father, a, be a, a, a better man when you strive to be God's man. So we need to step up to the plate and understand that we have to fulfill our promise to God and our families, that we live a life of confidence in God. And when you live a life of confidence in God, it is going to translate into uh, expecting to be blessed by God. How many of you want to get blessed by God? Okay, I'm going to show of hands. Now let me ask a deeper question. How many of you expect to be blessed by God? Hello? Praise God. See, I'm looking for, I'm expecting a blessing. Every time I walk around the corner, I'm looking for a miracle around the corner. God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all we can ask or hope or think. Right. According to the power that is within us. Ah, to him be the glory. Not you, but to him be the glory. Right. In Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Now, as we turn to this passage, um, let me begin... Let me begin by stating the obvious, okay? See, God, when God blesses us uh, and we expect to be blessed by God, we are thus commanded to position ourselves to become a greater conduit of those blessings. Right. Brother Mary, what do you mean by that? I'm saying if you've been blessed... You ought to be in the business of blessing somebody else. Amen. Let God's blessings flow uh, from God to you, but not only to you, but through you to somebody else. Amen. See, it's been said that hurt people hurt people, but blessed people, amen. amen. Blessed people keep all the blessings to themselves. <laughs> no, 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 no. God didn't write that passage. No, we write that passage. When you have been blessed, one of the evidences and the telltale signs that you've been blessed is the fact that you are actively pursuing opportunities to be a blessing to somebody else. Isn't that what the church is all about? Isn't that that we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb? And therefore, we're letting everybody know that redemption and salvation and blessings, harmony, peace, love, and tranquility are found in Christ. In Christ Jesus. So therefore, let me give you a contextual setting so we can go into this. Again, we're talking about the impeccability. The impeccability. When I say impeccable, uh, I mean flawless. I mean uh, uh, faultless. I mean perfect. There's something unimpeachable. Uh, there's something impeccable about the love of God. Beyond uh, challenge beyond refutation okay now when you talk about my love we can challenge that you know as, uh, as flawed creatures but as we talk about the father we have to understand that he's flawless see if I can describe love love to God and love to man is the sum and substance of all true religion you see it's because uh, without love all other gifts and attributes uh, would be pointless and ineffective. See, that's why we're in 1 Corinthians today. See, 1 Corinthians helps us understand uh, that if I have a tongue, if I speak with the tongues of men and angels of heaven, I love. I'm like James Brown. I'm talking loud and saying nothing, right? I can give my body uh, to be burned sacrificially. I can do all these different things. But if it's not motivated, and guided and directed by love is nothing. <sighs> Isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting that uh, when the Bible talks about uh, those persevering gifts, he balls them down uh, as, as he goes through this whole discourse about all the gifts and how they were tripping over the gifts. Okay? And then he boils it down to three things. 
uh, that would remain faith, hope, and love. He said these three, and then he said, but the greatest is love. See, love uh, endures uh, beyond the end. <laughs> See, faith and hope gets you to the end, right? But love transcends and gets you beyond the end. See, we'll talk about that in a minute. Let's get into the lesson, okay? Again, 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 we're in 1 Corinthians, uh, the 13th chapter, and we're beginning in verse number 4. And I want to begin by writing this down. Love is impeccable in relation to saints. Mm -hmm. See, let's, let's keep this thing grounded in the context of the, ta of the text. This is something that was uh, very uh, disturbing uh, if you notice in verses 1 through 3, uh, if 1 and through 3 is designed to teach us about the emptiness, the futility of gifts that are not controlled by love, then verses 4 through 7 uh, enumerates characteristics of love as it relates to congregational interaction. Well, you, I thought you was Father's Day, yeah? It's Father's Day. I want to talk about how we have to make sure that we are interacting with our children uh, in a certain way. But you see, the text is talking about how uh, the church at Corinth uh, were acting as though they had lost their mind. Okay, they were the carnal corral. They were just living and doing things the way they wanted to do it. And that's why they were chastising and criticizing the Apostle Paul. Because he was laying the hammer down. He is saying, hey, the word of God tells us we ought to live this way. And they said, you know, we don't even believe in this joke over here. <laughs> Isn't it strange that sometimes when the messenger shares the message of God, uh, they kill the messenger. Right. They do a character assassination of the messenger. Well, notice he says, he says, charity or love, it suffers long and is kind. Charity envies not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Now, let me stop right there uh, because uh, verses 4 through 7 begins to help us to understand these characteristics um, for congregational interaction. You know, you know, as you go back and look at the text yourself. Uh, beginning at chapter 1 through chapter 4, we see that this big, big brouhaha because of this whole idea of factions and party spirit and schisms and division uh, in the body, which was threatening the very unity of the church. These folk were acting, what's Sunday morning? I don't, a certain language I can't use right now. Uh, this is my Sunday morning language. <laughs> But the point is, um, it says love is patient. All you fathers, I want you to understand that. Love is patient. All you church leaders, all you, all you members, all you good Christians, love is patient. In other words, love, um, it suffers long. Not only is love patient, but love is patient, watch this, under trials. See, it's one thing for you to be patient and you to be good, you know, you know, a kind, I get along with everybody kind of guy when everything is going well. But what happens when trouble comes? What happens when something, when there's a fly in the ointment and something just gets on your last nerve and, and it'll push your button? How patient are you then when someone rails at you? And everything in your fiber, everything in your being, say you got to get some get back and some comeback and some payback. How patient are you now? Love is patient, long suffering under trials. It, 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 it suffers long under adversity and even persecution and provocation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't provoke me. Yeah, don't, 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 make, don't, don't make me come out of my bag. Remember the time I talked about the junk drawer? <laughs> Everybody had that drawer, have all the junk in it. You got a junk drawer in your heart. If somebody say something wrong to you, you go in your junk drawer and pull out some stuff that's been buried in that junk drawer. 
How do you handle? How do you respond in adversity? How do you uh, respond when times are rough, when, when, when things are challenging to you? Persecution. See, love is enduring. So it gives you the capacity to, to endure uh, and to put up with and to be long-suffering. Love, uh, uh, see, this idea of patience, it is a, it's a state of mind, a state of uh, remaining tranquil, even in the midst of a storm. Now, even in the midst, you can have tranquility and calm. And whatever's going on around you, within your heart, Jesus will say to your heart, peace, be still. And give you solace and peace. Well, you don't have to react violently. Love of the love of God and the love of man, for God's sake, is patient toward all men. It suffers the weaknesses of others. It suffers the ignorance of of others. It suffers uh, all malice of the children of God. We're talking about uh, intercongregational relationships, first of all. As Paul is talking to uh, this congregation, he said, love, not only is it patient, but it's kind. In other words, it's tender and compassionate. There's a certain meekness not to be uh, misconstrued for weakness. Uh, it is your power still harnessed I used to say, I used to say uh, strength and power under control, right? Until I realized it's strength and power under God's control. It's harnessed by the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit can, can, can take all of that stuff and all that uh, fleshly and carnal explosion, and he can temper that thing. Yeah, yeah, love is kind, tender, compassionate. Uh, obliging to others, it creates uh, trouble to no one. And love is not jealous. Mm -hmm. Love is not jealous, does not grieve because of the spiritual prosperity of others, does not grieve because of the uh, material prosperity of others, does not grieve when someone seems to be getting ahead, does not grieve when one of the crabs get out of the bucket. Celebrate the crab getting out of the bucket instead of using big old sinful claws to pull them back down. This is what love will do. See, these were the problems for the children of God who were experiencing this at Corinth. Therefore, Paul presents the characteristics of our Heavenly Father. You know, he, he notice what he does not do. He does not get caught up in, for the last 12 chapters, he's been dealing with these folk for their carnality. But then he begins to shift the light to, to God's love. Okay, God's not jealous of you. God is patient with you. He is kind to you. How many of us can say that God is not kind? God is good. He's kind. He, he's compassionate towards us. And therefore, uh, the apostle uh, presents these characteristics uh, as a template of a kind of high regard that we have to have for one another. You ought to regard one another highly. Don't look to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Always building up and lifting up and holding up, edifying one another, encouraging one another. Um, every earthly father should imitate the pattern of fatherhood as displayed by our heavenly father. Because uh, love is impeachable as it relates to how you react and interact with other believers. Okay? But not only that, love is impeccable in relationship to self. Let's look at the text again. Notice what it says in verse 4, the latter part. I read the whole thing. It says, charity suffers long and is kind. Charity envies not. Okay. Uh, vaunt is not itself. Is not puffed up. Okay. And going into verse number 5, it says, does not behave itself uh, unseemly. See, it's, it's the, against the... Can I, can I have a teaching moment here? It's against the backdrop of the troubles in the church uh, that makes it clear why self-examination is a vital uh, and important component in fatherhood. You got to examine yourself. See, don't, don't use this passage to look at other people. 
This is for self-examination. Oh, yes. And, and so uh, the dynamics of party loyalty, notice in chapters one through four, they would say, I'm of this person, I'm of that person. And, you know, they, were, they had all these cliques and all these schisms and all these, you know, these part, the party spirit. I'm in this camp and I'm in that camp. Therefore, I'm, I'm better than you because of the camp I'm in and who's preaching. I obeyed the gospel under, I'm bringing it home now. Uh, we are, <laughs> and, and who seems to me, you know, my preacher and all that kind of stuff. And we begin to build ourselves up in relationship to who we hang with. Not only that, in chapter 5, there was a big thing about immorality and fornication that goes on into chapter 6. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and therefore, uh, in chapter 8, we see the struggle uh, about the strong. Everybody want to be the strong, right? But if you strong, therefore, you will bear with the weak. Isn't it amazing that folk who say, I'm strong, I'm the, I'm the stronger brother, don't have time for the weaker brother, <laughs> which exposes their own weakness. So if you are strong, you have to get outside of yourself and bear with those who are weak. And, and so in, in chapter 8 and through 10, he deals with that. He has to deal with the pride competition in chapter 12 of the tongue speakers and the, and, and the prophecy. The, the prophets. He has to deal with all that mess. And so therefore, as he deals with that, uh, Paul presents a theological critique all in the name of agape. He gives this critique. And the critique is as follows. Number one, we find that um, uh, when we talk about love in relationship to self, love never boasts or love never is proud. See, sometimes we want to toot our own horn, don't we? So, oh, look at me. Can I talk? I'm looking at y'all eyeball to eyeball. Sometimes, sometimes we can get proud. I'm talking to the wrong crowd. Okay, I, I wanted to say um, love. Well, agape. Um, never boast. And it's uh, it, it's not proud or, let me use another word, it's not arrogant. See, I have a civic pride. I'm a Meriwether. I'm proud of my father, my mother, all that kind of stuff, yeah. I'm a member of the body of Christ. I have pride about that, you know. But that, 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 that brings humility and not arrogance. It may bring a confidence, but not an arrogance. You feel me? So sometimes we can get arrogant because I know a couple more passages than you know. Until I run into someone who knows a couple more passages than I know, then I feel inferior. <laughs> no, 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 no. Love does not boast. See, see, love for God produces humility and meekness, right? But love for man manifests that humility and meekness in how I interact with others. Love becomes the wind. See, love is the wind beneath someone else's wings. Yeah. Opposed to you sucking all the wind out of the, out of the room <laughs> on yourself. If you love someone, if someone is the object of your love, then you want the best for the object of your love. And therefore, you will exhaust every expense. Every, that's why love is sacrificial. For God so loved the world that he gave his best when you were at your worst. Yeah. You didn't deserve Jesus. No, no, no. That's the love of the Father. That's the character and characteristics of fatherhood. We would do well to understand that and begin to inculcate those principles to our lives. Notice, notice. Love is never unseemly or rude. Sometimes we can be downright rude. Uh, love never acts out of character. Love displays good manners. Love never seeks its own. <sighs> Love moves beyond the spirit of hidden agendas. Sometimes we have hidden agendas, ulterior motives, you know, as to why we do what we do. 
See, you can do the right thing for the wrong reason. Have you ever believed that? you believe that? You can do the right thing, and everybody can say, oh, he did a great job, but for the wrong reasons. God looks at the heart. God knows what's going on in your heart. Not only does he, is he able to see your, your, your faults in broad daylight. That's what the sun shines to do. It, it, it exposes you. But also the heat of the sun is a cleansing agent uh, that sanctifies you. Um, the character of love is revealed by its regulating power over the heart of the believer. Did y'all get that? The character of love is revealed by uh, how it restrains us from operating according to the flesh. See, the love of God is revealed in as much as it, it begins to, to, to turn me away from sinful practices and behaviors. It turns me to the righteousness that is found in Jesus. That's what love will do. The Spirit gives us uh, the wherewithal to be loving to others. Now, each of us must ask the question, are you ready for this? How do I measure up under God's standard of fatherly love? I'll give you a chance to write that down. And how do I measure up according to God's standard? Not Brother Mary was standard, but God's standard of fatherhood, of fatherly love. That's what this is all about. The third thing I want to give you as we hasten to a close. Love is impeccable in relation to sin. Okay. We've been getting, well, I've been waiting for this one. In relation to sin. Let's notice what five, the latter part of chapter five, verse five and six. It says, I'll read all of five. It says, uh, does not behave itself unseemly. We talked about that. Seek is not her own, is not easily provoked. Thinketh. No evil. Rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Okay? Now let's see if we can un, 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 unwrap that. Uh, the power of love can be seen in the aggressive nature in which love acts. I often say love is a verb, right? It's about doing. It's not about simply articulation, but it's about duplication. It's about demonstration. Okay. That's what love does. It demonstrates. It acts. Yeah. But now I want to give you another angle with that. Because just as compelling uh, as is the evidence of love seen in what is done, it's also seen in what love does not do. For example, love is not irritable, okay? Because sometimes we get irritated. See, see, love is not easily provoked. Love thinketh no evil. Love does not keep record of wrong. And when I say keep record of wrong, I mean love does not keep score. Right. See, when you keep score, that simply means you want to do one of two things. You want to get even. <laughs> or you want to get ahead. Uh, why keep score? See, love does not keep score. That's carnality. That's the old man. But the Bible tells us this kind of love. See, when, when, when we obey the gospel, do you not know that God says uh, the old man is buried and crucified with Christ in baptism? Understand that. When, and, and God, as far as Psalm 103, uh, as far as the east is from the west, that's how far God removes your sins and your iniquities from you. He wipes the slate clean. He gives you a new lease on life. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love is not easily provoked. Love does not keep record of right and wrong, of wrong for the purpose of evening the score. Love is never glad about injustice or unrighteousness. See, if you love, if you have real genuine agape, um, you can't tolerate sin. 
in your life that helps you to live a right life, right? But also in the lives of others, that causes you to be evangelistic. Y'all get that? See, see, so when you have the love of God, you abhor it. Uh, you have a disdain for sin in your life and in the lives of others. And it moves you to respond through repentance for yourself, but through evangelism for others. How deep is your love is the, is the question of the day. See, love um, rejoices with truth. See, love uh, operates in the realm of truth. Now, let me just caution you on this because it was Abraham Lincoln who said, uh, one, one of the things that a lot of folk love about the truth is the fact that the truth hurts. And it's, I throw some truth on you just to hurt you. But you see, love speaks the truth, uh, but it's tempered in maturity. You know, it tells me what to say and what not to say. Just because something is the truth don't mean you got to just run your mouth. Sometimes you just need to button it up. Sometimes it's not the time. Sometimes it's not the place. Sometimes it's not you, the one who need to be saying it. Love. See, this is what fatherhood is all about because the father, so, so, you know, sometimes I may ask one of my children, did you do this or do that? And guess what? Let me tell you this. <laughs> they in the room. <laughs> Guess what? I already know. I already know. I already know. <laughs> God knows already. God already knows. He's given you an opportunity to come clean. <laughs> See, when we confess our faults, that word homo legale, uh, when we would confess, we're just harmonizing. With God's assessment, it's to say the same. We're speaking the same. God already knows that we've fallen short of the glory of God. We've sinned. Okay? He already knows that. But he's waiting on us to come clean. See, if you are sick, but you claim that you are right, there's no need for you to go seek a physician. Because you think you're okay. But once you are aware of the truth of God's word, and you have now done an honest um, uh, 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 examination of yourself in light of that truth, then it reveals to you your shortcomings. It reveals to you your, your inadequacy. It reveals to you your need for God. You need someone bigger and badder than you to get you out of this predicament. Amen. And so that's what this is all about. Finally, let me just go ahead and hasten. Uh, we got one more verse. Verse number seven, I've been saving that for last. <laughs> see, there's no, see, there's, there's no place in God's kingdom for those who are in love with evil. For those who are, are in love with what evil produces. It may give you a pot of gold, but you left a whole lot of bodies along, along the road to get to where you wanted to go. Finally, love is impeccable in relation to situations. Now, the question becomes, how do you display love? I want to make sure I got your attention on this one. This is for you. This is for you. How do you display love? In the moment when someone just said or done something that is extremely hurtful to you, and your adrenaline, your adrenaline is screaming, it's pumping. Your flesh is screaming at you to scream something at somebody else in retaliation to what you have perceived they've done to you. How do you deal with all this? We can throw this whole book out the window now. I can talk about love when I'm talking about somebody else. But now you're in a situation where you're going toe to toe. With somebody breathing hot air down your back. And everything within you is screaming, retaliate. Defend yourself. They said something about you. I got to get back. I got to do something. My pride is on the line. 
my manhood is being challenged. I got to check this mess, right? How do you do it? Talk to me. I've searched, I've searched, and I've come up inadequate in my response. I had to turn to the Word of God. I had to turn to the Word of God, and the Word of God says something like this. It says, it bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Underline the word all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Whatever the circumstance, whatever the situation, love gives you the wherewithal to take the higher ground. Love does that. Uh, it gives you what you need uh, to get past. It never gives up. You see, uh, Romans 15 and 1 says, uh, we then that are strong, we ought to bear what? The infirmities of the weak, right? So never be too quick to give up on people because God never gave up on you. Amen. We want to throw people off, off, the, off the ship, you know, throw them overboard, kick them to the curb. But God has not given up on you. Don't give up on folk. Not only that, uh, love never loses faith. See, 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 love is always hopeful. Love is always trying to bring out the best good in a person. Love is always sacrificing of self to ensure the well-being of somebody else. That's what love is all about. Uh, isn't that what Jesus was all about? Yeah. I can see Jesus on the cross. Uh, they said uh, he could have called legions of angels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But if he does that, uh, where are we? Love kept Jesus. I thought for a long time, and they pierced him uh, in the side, and, and they nailed him on his feet, and they put nails uh, to nail him to the cross. I thought it was the nails. I thought it was the nails that kept him on the cross. Until I begin to understand, it was love. Love of the Father. Love for his creation that he could not come down. He already made a decision. Not my will, but thy will be done. How does love motivate you, fathers? How does love motivate you, saints, to endure, to put up with, uh, not because of, but in spite of? Love endures through every circumstance. The Father's love always protects, always trusts, it always hopes, and it always perseveres. The Father's love never fails. So, happy Father's Day. If you're here today, and you know that you need to be a better version of fatherhood, there's some things you may need to repent of. There's certain things, there's certain associations you may need to run to, and there's certain associations you may need to run from. God will reveal that to you. But at this point, if there's well, those of you who are, have not uh, put Jesus on in baptism for the forgiveness of sin, and you want to be uh, in this community we call the faithful, all you need to do is say, yes, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. I understand and recognize my need for him. I was destitute and inadequate on my own. But Jesus died. He was buried. He rose again on the third day. And when I embrace that, when I appropriate that to my life through uh, dying to my sin, confessing Jesus as Lord, and being buried in the watery grave of baptism for the remission of my sins, do you not know that God wipes my slate clean? He gives you a new lease on life. I don't know who you are or where you are. But if any of this message resonates with you, make a response as together we stand and sing a song of encouragement. Sure.